Detta är den ukentliga nyhetssändningen från Europa. Every day they used to business sitting there for magic potions destroying me friends stealing his world and uh, greetings to everybody out there listening in Radio Land and that is www.peoplesinternetradio.com and you are listening to me you are probably also hearing my dogs <laughs> and uh, a big hello from me Jimmy Hagen and uh, I've also got Sean McGee here with me this is European News Weekly and uh, I think we're on week 28 of this show and uh, we're cruising along just nicely I'd like to remind folks about the uh, donate button there and uh, I'll say no more about that but um, and Sean how are you? are you well my friend? Uh, not too bad, yeah. It's uh, been going through the news this week and uh, lots of stuff going on around the world as usual. Um, there's been the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, sort of commemoration. Uh, that's uh, the day, This is the day, actually, that the Nagasaki uh, bomb was uh, dropped um, so many years ago, 70 years ago. Indeed. So uh, basically, there's, there's been a lot of information about that going around. Uh, maybe we'll be uh, discussing that, I think, with Chris Busby in the second hour. Um, and uh, we'll probably have a few stories that will mention it a little bit as well. Okay, so I'm getting um, a message there from uh, Tony in the chat box. He's saying that we're very quiet. And yeah, I think you're quite correct there, Tony. Uh, levels are looking a little bit down, so I'll just give it a little bit more oomph. As so um, hopefully, hopefully that will sort the uh, the little problem out there. Um, I think we're there now. Tony, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us. Okay, no. So um, we're kind of running short. We have uh, we have an extended extinction report this week, Sean, and um, we also have uh, an extended Chris Busby. So that's not leaving as much time for news. So do you want to crack on and cover a little bit of uh, European news that you've gathered for this week? I have a few little bits myself which we can go into as well. So. Sure. Right. Well, there's a nice little story uh, starting off with, with uh, GM crops, genetic, genetically modified crops, are set to be banned in Scotland. Uh, of course, the UK is uh, very open to it, uh, but uh, we're going to be seeing that Scotland's going to be uh, uh, saying no to uh, to uh, the GM thing. And of course, we know that Russia has banned GM food as well, uh, GM grain. Um, I've got a little story I was just going to bring in um, because, you know, obviously with the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, tragedy, um, that uh, an Indian rapper was, uh, has been overwhelmed by success of a protest song against Unilever um, about the Bhopal uh, uh, sort of uh, disaster uh, with this large mercury, uh, 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 sorry, a mercury poisoning disaster. That escaped uh, out of the factory, didn't it? And it it it, it killed countless numbers in, in that Indian town. Sure. Oh, my God, well, yeah. there's an article in The Guardian uh, and uh, discussing that and linking to the song and everything else. So I think I'll just sort of say, hey, everybody have a look at that one. Um, there's uh, a nice little story here which uh, sort of feeds into some of our Irish news with Shannon Airport, but uh, uh, six rebel psychologists have uh, fought a decade-long war on torture and won. Um, and so basically they're fighting back about this... Uh, uh, the um, psychologists that were involved in developing torture techniques for the American military. Um, and uh, that story is on BuzzFeed, and the author is Peter Aldous, A-L-D-H-O-U-S. And uh, I would say, you know, pop over, check him out. Um, and uh, it's, it's it's good to see that some psychologists have stepped up, uh, have been stepping up all the way along and trying to fight against the uh, the abuse of uh, psych because they're supposed to be sort of like doctors uh, working for the betterment of mankind, uh, not developing torture. So uh, that was uh, that one. Um, I would also point out that on Sputnik News, uh, Helen uh, Caldercott uh, brought to our attention some of the issues with TPP, and uh, uh, for those that uh, are into that, yeah, pop over to Sputnik News, she's done a, an article there about TPP, and how, how it will affect us, uh, basically all. Um, and uh, I think, basically, I'd also give a heads up to some beach art that was done uh, in the UK yesterday, um, and it was uh, connected to Marion Berkby uh, of Radiation Free Lakeland. 
um, and there seems to be really good activist going on, activism going on in uh, in UK at the moment. So it's uh, it's, 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 it's uh, reassuring to see it picking up a bit. Um, and they went into the piece of B, B chart, which was uh, a bit like Monks the Scream, uh, which they made out of shells and stone. Um, but uh, that was on the uh, beach at uh, Sellafield, where there's a radioactive contamination notice. Um, so uh, they were just trying to highlight to people on the beach uh, the issues with uh, particles that are uh, around. Um, and also we got from uh, Kumar, Kumar, Kumar Sundaram, uh, an Indian activist uh, and a nuclear activist as well. But he was uh, at, he is at a, a, an exhibition at the moment as we speak, um, and uh, he's it was on Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, at the Regional Science Centre in Bhopal. And he's uh, speaking as we speak, as I say, uh, over there uh, on the atomic bomb and bombings uh, 70th anniversary. Um, he put uh, a picture up on his uh, Facebook uh, showing uh, uh, a sign saying, remember Hiroshima, remember Bhopal. Of course, both, uh, you know, sort of uh, industrial nuclear accidents of uh, various types. Um, so that uh, uh, there was also a really good uh, story that's gone viral, which is a photo of two, uh, s- uh, some three, is it three Palestinian men uh, protecting an Israeli policewoman uh, from mm. uh, rocks being thrown by Israeli settlers, uh, which is just a bit of an odd one. But um, I thought I'd mention that, and you can get to see that picture in the story at MiddleEasternMonitor.com. Okay, and uh, Chernobyl Children International also put out uh, uh, sort of a, a, a sort of a, a message on their Facebook, uh, just commemorating uh, the day that Nagasaki bomb was dropped. Um, and of course, we know eighty thousand. I think it was seventy-five thousand people were killed instantaneously, and eighty thousand were very badly damaged. Um, so, um, and if I was going to sort of say that, I'd, there was a story came out in Russia uh, where they were basically. Uh, they had a Russian ambassador who was uh, in Hiroshima very shortly afterwards. Um, and uh, this story is actually on fortness.blogspot.in. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Um, so there's a, a doctor report seeing three bombs dropped on parachutes, two of which did not explode and were collected by the military. The doctor experienced uh, diarrhea after drinking the water. Other rescuers got sick after 36 hours. The doctor said that those in the effect, uh, that those affected the white blood cell count reduced from 8,000 per cubic centimeter to 3,000, uh, 1,000, even 300. Uh, which causes bleeding from the nose, throat, eyes, and from the uterus in females. The injured died after three to four days. The injured who are evacuated heal faster. Those who drank or rinsed with the water in the impact area died thereafter. After a month, it was considered safe, safe to stay in the impact zone. However, it was still not conclusive. According to the doctor, rubber clothing offered protection against uranium, as well as many materials, which is a conductor of electricity. And I would just say that we were talking about the uranium content of these bombs of Christopher Busby in our second hour. And I'll go back to the uh, last bit of the quote. A girl who visited the area a few days after the blast got sick in one to two weeks and died three days later. So uh, these are sort of first-hand reports, and there is a lot more of of this report by this uh, by this uh, uh, sort of uh, bureaucrat who was uh, in uh, in uh, Hiroshima and uh, did a report for the uh, uh, Russians. And this is a basically a Russian historical society has published a report on the Soviet ambassador to Japan on the aftermath of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the archive of foreign policy of Russia. So that's just come out and uh, it's worth it. It's uh, written by Kristina Rus um, and, uh, and Fort, uh, Fort Rus. Uh, that's f o r t r u s s dot blogspot dot i n. Um, you get the story there, and it's uh, it's quite interesting. It was published on August fifth, twenty fifteen. Okay, Jimmy, uh, over to you, mate. Okay, well, cheers for that, Sean. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, so, but I was just uh, picked up there during the week, and uh, there was another sinking in the Mediterranean, uh, another refugee boat, uh, Thursday the sixth, and this actually came through the RTE dot ie, believe it or not, uh, and a boat packed with up to seven hundred migrants capsized in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Libya with hundreds feared dead. Um, there was uh, ships there from Ireland and from Italy and um, the, uh, basically it appears what happened was that the ships were in the vicinity and the next thing you know this boat starts sinking. 
Um, and I did take a little bit of a note to myself and says, why do these boats always sink like when there's ships or rescue ships in the air? Are they being sucked purposely? Or, or what's the story here? Is this, uh, is this a way of getting refugees into into Europe, like without having to run the gauntlet of, of getting ships right the way across the sea? It's, it's quite an unusual one, I think, really. And, and I think some of the interesting uh, numbers as well, too, like in, in 2014, 3,229 migrant deaths were recorded like uh, and already here in 2015 we're up at 2,000 plus I, sp I suppose we're probably still waiting on the final numbers for the most recent sinking so um you know it's just it's just, it's just shocking to see uh, the, what's going on there in the Mediterranean and the plight of these refugees running and fleeing uh, wars in foreign climes and uh, another interesting point on that sinking was that w the youngest member of the that was found alive uh, in the waters was a, a little Palestinian girl, one year old. So um, it's, look how far afield some of these migrants were having to run. It's quite shocking, really. Um, also, um, I'll leave the nuclear one for for this week, but we have Pope Francis coming out, and he's trying. And the headline: This is coming out of um, MarketWatch.com. And Pope Francis ignites a revolt that will overthrow American capitalism. F Pope Francis is encouraging civil disobedience, leading to rebellion. Uh, Francis knows he's inciting political re uh, rebellion, this, uh, the article is claiming, and uh, uh, the uprising of the masses against the world's super-rich capitalist and right-wing conservatives uh, remain in denial, turning out uh, at the Pope's message, uh, uh, hoping he'll just go away like the Occupy Wall Street movement did. Like uh, This is an article from Paul B. Farrell. So uh, Pope Francis is not just leading uh, the second American revolution. He is rallying people across the earth, middle class, uh, and as well as the poor, inciting billions to raise up in a global economic revolution, one that could suddenly sweep planet uh, like the 19 or the 1789 French storming of the Bastille, which I think in a way is what we probably do need to, to get the planet back on track. But So but unfortunately, conservative capitalists such as big oil, cosh billionaires, uh, GOP Congress and all the fossil fuel climate science deniers are blind to the fact their ideology is on the wrong side of history, uh, that by fighting a, a no-win battle they are uh, committing suicide, self-destructing their own ideology. Now, an aggressive Pope Francis is, is on a mission to transform the, the mutant ideology of today's capitalist world uh, with its uh, rampant profit-centered climate uh, science denialism. Uh, fortunately, the Pope will soon confront and challenge America's GOP Congress directly and then the United Na Nations General Assembly to challenge the capitalist world's failure to take climate change action. Uh, and he say he he comments afterwards maybe they'll finally wake up. Um, I'm just not so sure about that. You know, um, I think if they were going to wake up, Sean, I think they'd be awake by now. What do you think? Well, it's uh, I think it's something we have to chip on. I mean, um, it's a shame we haven't got time to talk about um, sort of how the media has been manipulated. Uh, there's certainly some stories I'm working on uh, that, that are quite shocking. And although we're, we're saying saying what news isn't being delivered, uh, the news uh, that is being delivered. Um, is very slanted and there does seem to be a lot of uh, uh, things going on in the background that force uh, journalists and uh, media, you know, more things that uh, force these guys to have to come out with the uh, corporate stories that they are um, and avoiding all the uh, real human uh, uh, stories that we try to cover, you know, with our interviews. But uh, anyway, um, yeah. Any, anything else you've got to add on on the on? Well, on the... Geez, well, well. While we're covering the uh, the, the refugee crisis, um, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, Bulgaria uh, seems to be uh, erecting a, a 50 mile stretch of razor wire uh, along the Turkish border. It's 15 foot tall and five foot wide, and it's said to keep out 500 people a month, basically. So I just think it's kind of ironic, like um, that probably would would have been a route for some of the. Uh, for, for some of the refugees fleeing the wars in uh, Libya, Syria, Palestine, all places like that. So um, I think uh, it's because of like projects like this that we're seeing in Bulgaria with this razor wire fence that they're having to uh, run the gauntlet of the uh, of the dangers of making a, a dangerous crossing but on a flimsy boat. You know, I just it's quite shocking, really. You know, well, we should, I, we should I be... think I think NATO and uh, sort of uh, military sort of uh, people like this are making a big thing of the immigration problem. And there's a story in uh, in the UK, um, and somebody actually counted up how many immigrants actually moved to the UK. And it was like 7,000 as opposed to 70,000 in Germany. Uh, it was like a blip. Um, and, you know, we've done stories saying more people are leaving. You know, if you look at Ustat, more people emigrated out of the UK in 2014 than, than emigrated into the UK. 
Um, I, I think the immigration thing is, uh, you know, I think certainly in certain places it needs to be sorted, but but they could be spread throughout Russia, very, uh, throughout Europe, sorry, very easily um, without any major impacts. But uh, you know, if you're causing the wars, you've got to pay uh, the the costs. You know, which is which is is going to be people that that uh, will not want to live in the countries that that your military have ruined. You know, mm, so. Mm. And uh, there was an, also another story about the immigrants. Uh, there was uh, an African uh, ju- author who was uh, mouthing exactly what you said there, actually. She was saying that, uh, you know, it, it, is it okay just to uh, let people drown, you know, when you've got this sort of blockade going? And, uh, oh. you, you know, instead of trying to do the humanitarian work of rescuing the people, um, that you would actually, and then, you know, sort of dealing with the, with them afterwards. Um, and, but instead they're just letting them drown in, in the seas. It's, uh, they're delaying, you know, they're being very slow to act. Uh, you know, everything, everybody's booking, you know, sort of six, eight months in advance to do some action on, on, uh, on these immigrants that are drowning on a weekly basis. Um, so we're seeing, I think it seems to be a very much a military response. And, and, and she also said that, um, uh, you know, it's being used, uh, the fact that people were dying was being used as a way to discourage other immigrants, which uh, she said was nonsense, that wouldn't stop. Them. But, uh, no, of but yeah, no, that was, uh, it was a good, good point you brought up there. And, uh, it's, been, it's been echoed uh, by African, uh, an African author. Well, that's author. quite interesting, quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. I also noticed too, um, special forces disguised as ISIS fighters operating inside Syria. Uh, this was coming out of RT.com and it reported up to two SAS squadrons of men, uh, around 120 personnel in all, are operating inside the borders of Syria as part of Operation Shader, which aims to destroy equipment and munitions used by the Islamic State. Uh, the troops are operating under the US command as part of a coalition joint special operations task force. Uh, and a C- senior military source told the Express newspaper, essentially this is what we call penny packet operations, small individual incursions which hopefully join up to create tangible results. The view here is a long, is long uh, it's about uh, finding and engaging targets, yes, but it's also about assessing infrastructure and identifying where ISIS is hiding and uh, equipment in order to set the conditions for a potentially larger future engagement. Uh, you know what, I don't get it, like, you know, they've armed these guys, you know, they don't have to set up, like, operations to go in and find out what they've got. They know exactly what they've got to do. All they've got to do is just check their books, you know. They know exactly what these guys have and where it is. Uh, we've got we've got Turkey attacking uh, the Kurds, uh, but uh, under the guise of uh, attacking ISIS, and uh, there's all sorts of strange things going on in that part of the world. A lot of different countries are working deals out uh, with the US in order to uh, get a slice of uh, the Syrian pie. Um, so it's uh, it's quite quite uh, an interesting situation, but um, it does sound like Russia has backed off its support of. Uh, of, uh, you know, Assad, they say, but then on the other hand, uh, uh, Putin actually has good good things to say about Assad. But, uh, well, we were well, seeing reports there during the week of, like, uh, allegedly uh, Russian paratroopers are ready to, to, to enter Syria if need be. Oh, well, that would be an interesting development <laughs> if they do, that's for sure. <laughs> so we're approaching uh, 20 past four, and um, I think if we're going to get through these interviews, we may start shortly. What do you think, Sean? Indeed. So we've got, uh, we've got, first off, we have, uh, Kevin Hester, yourself and myself, uh, just discussing things of a doomy nature. Uh, and we t- talked about quite a few other bits and bobs as well. We just, uh, went a bit off topic there, here and there. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then basically, uh, we have Chris Busby and the really amazing, uh, interview following up his article in the RT, uh, which he, he explains to us. And, and we sort of do a bit of, uh, discussion about Fukushima and, uh, Various other things, an update on the, uh, thyroid statistics, a shocking increase of 12, uh, more young people, uh, with thyroid cancer confirmed injured in, uh, here in Fukushima, uh, prefecture. So, uh, we're, uh, we, we discuss all that in the, in the second hour. And then third hour, I suppose we should say is the, uh, Irish hour. So we're going to be discussing, uh, Dennis, oh, am I allowed to say his name? <laughs> Better be careful. I don't want to get sued. Although, like, he's not going to have much fun suing me because I have no fun, so <laughs> let him, let him try. He's not having a microphone. <laughs> and he can't say computer, data protection laws. <laughs> right, so I'll just steam on ahead then with Kevin Hester and the Extinction Report. And uh, welcome to European News Weekly. We bring you the, ex- uh, the Extinction Report, uh, bringing uh, Kevin 
looking at and looking at the possibilities uh, that we could be facing. So, uh, with uh, further ado, I'll just start off by mentioning that I have a little report here, which is uh, that Eastern uh, Europe and uh, specifically Poland um, are having uh, quite a major heat wave. Uh, we'd obviously sort of uh, put heads up to the uh, sort of uh, Ukraine Chernobyl area where we would be a bit concerned about more wildfires. So there's been a couple this year already. Um, and um, over to you, I think, uh, Kevin, uh, you, you have something about Spain, I believe. Yes, there's been some very big um, fires burning in Spain. There's one in, in the Sierra de Gata mountain range that has been suffering scorching temperatures that are linked to the heat wave that's on the other top side of the Mediterranean in Iraq that's been killing lots of people. I, I think you'll talk about that in a moment. But the 6,000 hectares of uh, forest that have burnt in, in Spain. And this is this ongoing uh, story that we've been covering for the last three or four weeks where there's so much forest burning around the planet at the moment. There's millions of acres burning in the northern hemisphere and in Siberia and Alaska. There's tens of thousands of hectares burning in, in uh, California. This is a, a recurring theme that we're all seeing now, and I'll, I'll repeat myself that it's all happening at one degree C above baseline, and we're tracking way, way, way beyond that. So the, the incredible fires that we're seeing now are the beginning of a, of a mass burn off on our planet. Well, that's that's quite interesting because, uh, Kevin, we're seeing quite astounding temperatures and figures coming in from uh, Arabia, from places like uh, Iraq and from Iran, where they're seeing huge temperature increases now just at the minute. Like, um, I think the latest report that I've had now is from uh, a site called Rudaw, R-U-D-A-W dot net. Now, uh, the headline is, Iraq's scorching heat kills 52 children in refugee camps. Uh, and in, in a recent heat wave, uh, uh, and this is also compounded by the lack of electricity, which has led to the deaths of at least these uh, of these children, basically uh, from a war ravaged country, basically. So, um, couldn't let you go on that, basically. It's just it's all ex made so much worse because of the fact that the infrastructure has been destroyed in so many places, and that the the, the electricity supply is so erratic and also the water coming out of the taps which is all the things that people need to be able to do to mitigate and keep their wet bulb temperature under control there's a thing called wet bulb temperature where, where people's organs cease to, to function at around 35 or 36 degrees c that's that's their uh, skin surface temperature and what normally happens is people perspire and that that um that perspiration is the way that your body cools itself. But in, in, a, in these high humidity uh, heat waves that we're having now, we're finding that people, more and more people are hitting their wet bulb temperature than we would have expected years ago. One characteristic of our, of our heating when our atmosphere heats up is for every one degree, of, one degree Celsius of heating, we get 7% more moisture in the atmosphere. So that, that compounds the problem of these heat waves and makes them more fatal, which we're seeing every day now. Of course, like um, one of the things I've been learning while researching this uh, wet bulb temperature thing is that children and old people are, are are greatly affected by this effect because of the fact that they haven't got the ability to sweat as the normal adult would have. Like so, it, this is probably why we're seeing like the effects coming through with the children and deaths in Iraq with the children. Like uh, because because the children haven't got the ability to sweat. They're they're not able to relieve the pressure. Yeah, that's right. That, that not to be able to sweat to the same degree. Babies still sweat, but they don't have the same ability that that, that we do, and adult and um, older adults as well. One of the problems that I have with the statistics about all of these fatalities is that some of the people who are dying will be they'll be putting it down as that they died from old age, but the reality is the infirm and the elderly. Uh, are both more susceptible to dying in these conditions. And I, I believe that the numbers will be vastly higher than what they're saying. So, come here. This, this 70 degrees C temperatures we're seeing in Iran, how much are they out of the ordinary? Or is 70 degrees C the kind of a temperature that you see 
uh, every now and again in Iran, or is this really unprecedented? To my t to my knowledge, it is unprecedented. They do have extremely high temperatures. Getting into the fifties happens even in a place like Perth. That's that, that's been known to happen. But seventy, I just I never heard that number before this week. So uh, anecdotally, I can say to you that I think it is unprecedented. That's how many degrees? Further? Is that up on one hundred fifty, or is that approaching? Uh, I'm more? sorry, I come from the from the metric world. I'm not as as au fait with uh, Fahrenheit. Okay, no, that's cool. That's cool. We won't go there. So we won't go there. Uh, Sean, do you want do you want to jump? in here on, on, on any of these topics well no it's uh it's, it's just quite interesting i found that um we're seeing uh i think the keeney isle uh island at the moment uh are being uh swamped in by sea level rising um and uh you know obviously they've been hit with the nuclear bomb testing and uh they're living with the effects of that and now now the very land they they live on is is now being swallowed up by the sea um and uh yeah so it's it's quite interesting it's uh have, have we got any sort of sea rise level uh sort of other indicators around the planet well, the, the sea, one of the things that people need to realize about sea level rise in the Pacific Islands is that at the moment it is still only millimeters that it has gone up. But also the, the acidity of the ocean around those islands has, has, uh, it's, they become much more acidic. And what that's doing is it is making the, the aquifers more brackish than they used to be and the soil as well. So they've got having a lot of crop failures in those places. And then of course, you know, the United States tested 24 nuclear weapons at Bikini Atoll. And the largest of them was Bravo, you know, 15 megatons. I think that was in 1954. You know, those places have just been absolutely pilloried. And, and it, it, the, the criminal, well, one of the more criminal aspects of it is that they're suffering the brunt of all this, this, uh, global warming and of course the, the the nuclear weapons testing and those those countries have an extraordinarily small carbon footprint so the person who's created the least amount of this problem is suffering the most and will they be compensated properly for it of course they won't and how can you for, for stealing their entire culture from them no indeed well, I, been... I remember when i first started uh, hearing about the bikini atoll and 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 the people that used to live in that lovely region of the planet were moved physically moved removed from the islands and, and and sent off god knows where uh, removed from their from from their home so that like <laughs> nuclear bombs could be tested uh, it, it's it is it's criminal that's solid a say. lot of them were also used as an experiment and i know that sounds extraordinary but what they did was they tested and then after they had tested they went and analyzed the land and the people down that were downwind of those tests to see what the consequences of radioactive fallout would be on the on the ecosystem and on the people it is just absolutely mind mind blowing that they could be so callous and and uh, mendacious yeah, I think and topically that... enough obviously with hiroshima and nagasaki uh they did the very same thing as well i think the american uh government did yeah, that's right. I, I, I personally, you know, it's a good thing for us to talk about um, the, the only two nuclear weapons that have been used in anger in, a, in the history of this planet is that there's a lot of debate around the, whether it was necessary or not for the United States to use those weapons at the, that stage of the war. I find it extraordinary that there's a human being left on the planet who thinks it was justifiable. There's all the evidence to support the fact that the, the Japanese were trying to negotiate a surrender and because because the the um, the Allied forces were only prepared to take a complete and utter surrender, and they weren't prepared to give any conditions. And I think the the protection of the emperor was so critical to the Japanese people. They took the opportunity of using those weapons, and and a the psychopaths who have those toys invariably want to use them, and b I think they were sending out a very clear message to Russia and to a lesser degree China that we've got them and we're prepared to use them. Well, I think uh, Libby Halevi posted uh, an interesting video there during the week uh, through the social media, and uh, it was highlighting the, uh, what had happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it had uh, interviews with some of the people who were witnesses to actually what happened. And there was uh, the interesting bit I found in it, though, was they were interviewing some of the soldiers who were involved in the bomb run, and 
it was quite astounding. Like one or two of them were were quite adamant that they were quite happy about dropping that weapon of mass destruction on the, on the, on 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 those innocent civilians. And then there was another couple who were really regretful. And and but I just thought it was just really astounding that that even after so many years, that one or two of them were still so hard inside about dropping that bomb and still thinking that it was the right thing to do that just knocking for six i think you know what i would have loved to see in that situation is to get some psychologists to analyze the people who were still supporting it uh 50 years 60 years later and i i would almost certainly say that they would meet the criteria of either being sociopaths or psychopaths yeah it would be an interesting study well there is a typical psychological symptom called uh sort of well uh where, where they're sort of blocked sort of uh, an idea, you know, to protect themselves from possible, uh, how, how things basically sort of actually worked out. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting one, but there's a lot of nationalism to do with this as well. And there was a, a great propaganda push and people feel very comfortable with that initial propaganda, uh, as being correct, you know. And so that's, that's in, in America, this is. So I suppose, I suppose there's an element of that as well. There's just very efficient propaganda. There was Saying that people from uh, who were brought up in the in, in the uh, sort of uh, German youth uh, brigades um, today, they are uh, they, they still think fondly and they think uh, that they're, they're the most. There's a study done and they were the most kind of racist of uh, of all the Germans as the people that were brought up. So they remembered their childhood, uh, their younger years, and um, and they were very powerfully in that headset. Um, still, many years later, you know, being against um, people of other um, uh, outside the group, you know, people. Uh, well, it's the nature of indoctrination. Uh, most people would say to you that the more indoctrinated people are, the more that becomes an integral part of them. You know, the Jesuits used to say, "Give us a child until they're seven, and we've got them forever." So, well, we have uh, definitely uh, sort of to look at that. How, how about you, Jimmy? Anything else that uh, we're going to be covering? Is there any? Well, anything I, I to, think to, I to think we need to jump over now, well, because I know we've got limited time. So I want to jump over to the article that was brought out at Brad Blog dot com uh, dr michael e mann on dr james hansen's bombshell new report on sea level rise now manson tells hansen disturbing studies suggest that climate change is proceeding faster uh, and it's larger in magnitude than what the ipcc uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change reported and that's and that's been true at, at every juncture uh, we have been uh, tended to underestimate the rate of magnitude of the changes what hansen has shown is that indeed there is reason to at least suspect the possibility of a worst case scenario that is a lot worse than anything the IPCC talks about. So that's a quote from uh, Mr. Hansen. Those two uh, climate scientists that you have quoted are recognised as being two of the very le most leading authorities on climate change and, and, uh, and on the planet. And the first case, James Hansen, has done something very extraordinary and unusual, where he has released a paper prior to peer review. It's virtually unheard of at that level. The reason he's gone ahead and done that is the, the, the sense of urgency that some of these scientists are now seeing and, and realizing that we can't follow the normal peer review process, which takes so long. It can take two or three years to get a, a paper submitted and peer reviewed, sometimes up to six. And the IPCC is not allowed to, to discuss or, or include in its um, pronouncements any paper that is less than three years old. In a time of abrupt climate change, that is a completely unacceptable and, and fallacious position to be taking. I'll give you an example with Michael E. Mann. I spoke to uh, Michael in September last year, uh, just before I brought Professor Guy McPherson out to New Zealand for his speaking tour. And I mentioned that we believed that we we're in a time of abrupt climate change and that we were facing near-term human extinction. And Mike Mann's reply to me was, I can't go there yet, Kev. Those are his words, I can't go there yet, Kev. Well, in the last couple of weeks, like you said, I think that, that article you're referring to is dated the 29th of last month. He's come out and said it has is, is now gone exponential. When you talk about exponential and the exponential function, this will freak anyone out who knows anything about math or that function. 
I was at a at a play last night called Between Two Waves, which is a, a play on on the dynamics between couples and and scientists uh, co- covering climate change. And there was a, a, a talk afterwards with Rod Oram, who's one of our main uh, finance uh, writers in New Zealand, who's writing now about how how our climate change catastrophe is going to affect the financial markets. And also um, Bernie McDerm- McDermott, the um, the CEO of uh, Greenpeace New Zealand, she was there, and we had a Q and A and a talk afterwards. And I mentioned that uh, Michael Mann had said that we've now gone exponential, and and the look on on the CEO of Greenpeace's face was stunning. She was completely and absolutely gobsmacked when I when I quoted Michael Mann. And once this sinks in with people, once people realise that it's gone exponential, this is a massive game changer. Indeed, uh, I, I, I think you posted a video online there not too long ago. There was a there was a mathematician explaining the exponential function, and he focused on the idea of seven percent. And what does seven percent mean? And do you know what? That blew my mind. What 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 does seven percent mean? And uh, it is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, maybe maybe you could sort of like, do you, could you could you give our listeners a, a little link or a suggestion on search term for that? I can't find it just at the minute, but that's that's a fantastic insight into the exponential function. Yeah, it is incredible. I'm just pulling it up now. That I've got the exact uh, name of it. It's uh, available on YouTube. Uh, just bear with me for a second and I'll sure. for you. Sure. I mean, I could mention quickly while we're talking about the exponential function yeah. uh, that in terms of uh, sea level rise, uh, we would see that uh, maybe only a small rise in sea level may cause quite a large difference in the ter- type of surge that one might have. So um, what would what we would expect if, you know, the sea level rose, uh, say, 10 millimetres, is that we'd say, well, it's become 10 millimetres higher. But it's not, it doesn't work that way at all. If we, we might be able to put that 10 millimetres and say, well, that will cause in a surge that may cause another metre of surge walk. You know, uh, now I'm only using just general figures, but um, I think at the end of the day, when we're talking about exponential function, we're actually seeing the, uh, in terms of uh, sea level, as we're saying that, you know, if it rises a meter, well then, you know, are we going to have 20 meters of, uh, of surge uh, when we get these particular, you know, of high moon and, uh, you know, wind patterns that are going to be stronger, causing bigger surges anyway. Uh, but but uh, the exponential function is if you've got more water, maybe more would be shifted in a surge. But uh, but there is some theories out there that do support this. Um, but I, I, I think uh, uh, the uh, IPCC, or no, sorry, the uh, sort of official people that uh, deal with uh, sea level rise calculations are saying that they just have to wait 20 years in order to get this data. They, they can't plan it at all. Uh, but if it does show that it's exponential, uh, then basically uh, the problem of sea level rise becomes a much bigger one uh, than we've been led to believe. So, all right, over to you guys. Well, if, if, what, if what's been suggested is that like we're, we're about 40 years behind uh, it, with the effects that we're seeing, so, um, you, you know, basically... They can't sort of like predict these things. They, they, they really, you know, they can't say for sure what sort of sort of levels we're going to be getting because we're 40 years behind. Is that correct, Kevin? In, in, uh, there's, there's some debate about the, the lag, the cause and effect lag between, we used to say 40 years. That was the standard that we all thought. And in, in recent papers have come out, they're saying that it's probably closer to 10 to 20 years, which is good news. You know, it would have been a lot worse if it had been 40. Right. But the reality, the thing that I would like to draw people's attention to is that when this whole obsession and discussion around sea level rise is forgetting that we're going to have habitat loss on, on, a, on an extraordinary large degree well before that sea level rise happens. Like we're, ta- we're looking now at our forests. Globally, our forests are on fire, right? Way before the sea level goes up. They're talking about all, all these meters of, of sea level rise in, in Miami and in New York and in all these places. I believe most people on the planet will be gone before that happens. I don't think many people are going to get to see downtown New York flooded. I think we'll all be extinct. We'll either all be extinct or most people on the planet will be wiped out by that time. We spoke a moment ago about the the YouTube presentation about the exponential function, mm. and I found it first. It's called Arithmetic Population and Energy. 
So if you if you uh, go onto YouTube and search that, it's by Dr. Albert A. Bartlett. It's absolutely wonderful. It's from uh, 2012. But yeah, I really think that people should be careful about getting too distracted about sea level rise. In a way, it's a, a bit of a red herring. If there's no habitat and nothing and no one can live, it won't matter what the sea level it's is. It's certainly a problem for the pe people in Bikini at the moment that are getting flooded out. Oh, but yeah, absolutely. And in all the deltas around, the, the deltas are already job. suffering, yeah. Yeah, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be seeing hundreds of millions of people displaced in in Bangladesh very very soon. I believe way sooner than the decades away that we're talking about. Sure, it's very worrying, and and we we do have this uh, the uh, exponential function on on sea level rise, which could cause massive surges across places like Bangladesh. You know? It'd be quite well, yeah, that's uh, right. A few weeks ago, we had that uh, that three century loss where we lost three hundred and twenty thousand square kilometers of sea ice in one go. That's right. Yeah, I don't know if that was noticed on a global um, measurement it probably wasn't but you know when those things are happening you know it's going to happen very quickly mm -hmm. so come here if we could just jump to change sort of direction here for a second and there was also another bombshell study on methane er, emissions and uh, methane emissions being underestimated now there was an article by uh, Lauren McCauley which came out through uh, commondreams.org now, we were saying that the amount of methane being uh, leaked from natural gas production sites has been hugely underestimated according to a bombshell new study released on Tuesday. Now, in a paper published at Energy and Science Engineering, expert and gas a industry consultant uh, Touch Howard argues that a, a much heralded 2013 study by University of Texas uh, relied on a faulty measurement instrument, uh, uh, the Baccarat High Flow Sampler, uh, causing its findings to be low ball actual emission rates by factors of 3 to 5. Now, th 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 there's more to this story, like, but um, basically what they're saying is that the machine that they were using, the instrument that was being used to measure the methane releases coming from these fracking stations, was being sort of lowballed by a factor of at least five. Absolutely extraordinary. Not not surprising, but extraordinary. And it's important for people to realise that methane is of an order of forty to a hundred times worse than carbon. So when 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 you see those those amount of methane releases being being monitored, you know, finally you've got when you're comparing it to carbon, it's vastly worse. Even though it, it, it is not as it doesn't have such longevity in the atmosphere as carbon does. Carbon's virtually there forever. It's got a seven but, year. Um, is, if I'm correct, is it a seven year lifespan it's got before it totally uh, converts into CO2? What ionizes into carbon effectively, yeah. So right. yeah, it drops way down to what the normal carbon uh, forcing degree would be. But see, we've got no idea how much it is really, and it, it's this has all gone on in a big spurt that is not part of the IPCC calculations because a whole lot of that mountaintop mining and fracking is very new. So that's only been happening in recent times, you know, since since we've hit peak oil and and uh, all of this new shale gas exploration and extraction is taking place. So all of that kind of forcing is new to the game. All right. So there are lots of reasons there uh, to be very very skeptical about fracking. Uh, this is one that we should be taking in mind, and uh, hopefully our friends in Shell uh, from, from Shell to Sea will be coming up of coming up with good solutions on how to uh, get rid of these corporations out of this country here in Ireland for example I don't know what other people are doing in other parts of the world but I think fracking is uh, is, is dead in the water as is Irish water so <laughs> um, over to you well, Sean I, I, <laughs> or whoever wants to take over <laughs> well for me uh, when, when I look at all this talk about exploration whether it's fracking or whether it's shell um, steaming to the Arctic as we speak with their oil rig to drill for more. The cognitive dissonance that, dissonance that goes with this is, is breathtaking for me. We already know that we cannot burn 80% of the existing fossil fuel reserves that we know of. We know we can't use 80% of it. Why on earth would we be looking for more? Why have we not? Why have we not had a global moratorium on exploration? It just proves to me and anyone paying attention that the powers that be have absolutely no intention of doing anything about this. It's going to be business as, un as usual until we topple off the cliff, and we're in that toppling phase as we speak. Now, 
now that we know it's exponential. I think while we're here on the subject of the Arctic uh, drilling expedition, and uh, I think uh, Greenpeace activists had quite an interesting success there, uh, hanging from the bridge and preventing the uh, the ship from leaving harbour during the week there. So uh, hats off to the guys there. In uh, w- w- uh, help me out here, guys, because I can't remember where that was happening. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. A good friend of all three of ours, um, Mimi. Jemaine, she lives in Portland, and it was in Portland, and Mimi got a chance to go down and see them, and she said that the buzz that was in the city at the time was just yeah. phenomenal. They did an a, a absolutely amazing action, and that's the kind of action that people like myself, you guys, and Chris Hedges are advocating. You know, we've really got to stop them. We've got to stop these ships at the port. We've got to stop the, the coal trains on the rail lines. We've got to actually stand in front of them and stop them, because... The normal agitation, this clickathons with people signing petitions, that's never going to stop anything. We have to chain ourselves to the tracks. I mean, we have to bear in mind that, I mean, personally, I, I think you should try everything, uh, but we have to bear in mind that uh, while that was going on, there was uh, three or four other rig- rigs that Shell have got up in the Arctic already doing their thing, you know, so... Yeah, and the Russians are doing the same thing as well. They 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 aren't monitored as as much as perhaps Exxon and Shell. I think uh, they're doing something with BP actually. They had to deal with yeah. BP at one point there. Yeah, good old BP, the people who killed Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> yeah, well they're still killing it yeah. day by day. Let's not forget about that anyway. Uh, we we well we've got uh, Charles Williams Diggs interview that uh, breaks that particular sort of nasty situation down quite nicely. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that um, there's a lot of talk now. Uh, Nafiz Ahmed put out a paper just recently where he's talking, with, um, you know, that the Pentagon is describing climate change as a threat multiplier. And on the 6th of August, Nafiz, who, who's an absolutely wonderful um, writer who writes Middle East Eye, um, he wrote an article, Pentagon prepares for a for century of climate emergencies and oil wars. They're getting ready for it. These are what I've been calling the habitat wars. Nafiz has called it the uh, climate emergency and oil wars, but I think they will morph into habitat wars myself. Well, on that cheerful note, um, have we got, got anything else to add there, Jimmy? Well, uh, I was going to ask you, Mr. Positivity, if you had anything to add. I, I do, actually. I think we're all going to survive and live happily ever after, right? <laughs> and and we're going to ba- ban nuclear weapons and nuclear power stations, and we're going to get wind, solar, and the aluminium fuel cell, by the way, which everybody uh, should know about. It's been one of the best-kept secrets uh, for your, if you do want to have electric cars. That's the way to go. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm sure that's all going to happen. And uh, I'm going to be here on the Costa del... Uh, Costa del Limerick. Costa uh, del Limerick. <laughs> yeah, a bit warmer, I suppose. Um, so we'll have palm trees here. And, uh, you know, I think we do need to sort some of the problems out there. There will be mass emigration and we need to make sure people uh, people can re- re- sort of relocate in a humane way as opposed to, you know, putting up walls and living uh, living in bunkers. And 50-mile-long so, barriers of, like, uh, what's that wire that they use for for, for army wire, uh, steel? Yeah, razor wire. Oh, yeah, razor wire. Wire. We, we see Hungary got 50 kilometres of that stuff up now at the minute to keep refugees out so you know do you know where i first saw razor wire was at fortress wapping in london when um rupert murdoch the, the famed rupert murdoch uh set up his printing presses in 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 wapping and it was incredible at that time that was in the mid 80s and in those days the only people who could buy razor wire was the army it was, it was limited to the military the british military in the uk and yet rupert murdoch had it around fortress wapping to keep keep out the protesters us it was quite extraordinary. That's how that's how intrinsically linked he was to Margaret Thatcher. He was allowed to get military grade uh, razor wire. Amazing. Yeah, they, they were using the military in the riots um, around that time as well. Uh, they they dressed sure, up yeah. in police uniforms and uh, ship them down in army uh, lorries. So there was a lot I of thought that I'd seen a, a policeman get murdered on one of those demonstrations. Oh. I thought uh, I, I watched him get attacked, and I was sure he had died. And I read nothing about it in the paper the next day. No, this, there was a, a lot of violence, but uh, the, the police were asked to come in really heavy. They were surveilling all the protesters. 
Ghostbusters, and uh, and they never really stopped surviving. They've it's got a lot worse now, actually. So oh, just... I watched them charge with those horses into people who were, who were doing nothing. It was extraordinary. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, I've been on a few it. protests as well myself over in uh, Great Britannia, and I've seen horses run women over, and it's not pretty size. Sure. It's terrifying. And uh, there's nothing given to the uh, uh, sort of uh, people that lost their jobs. You know, they should have been given an education and uh, and sort of business and investment in the air, in in their areas. Uh, and that never really sort of came together. So those areas are still kind of depressed. You know, mostly. I don't know if you know about the the, the trick that Margaret Thatcher and Rupert Murdoch played on the printers' union. Is in those days the printers had enormous pension funds. And if they were going to be made redundant, uh, they would have to get their pension funds out. So it was a contingent liability on books of those big newspapers that Rupert Murdoch bought. And what he did is he got Margaret Thatcher to pa pass a law. It would have been, I'm guessing, about 86, where if you were if you were in those unions and you were sacked on strike, you forfeited your pension fund, the the company contributions. Mm. He she passed the law for him. They all he he created the strike environment. They went on strike and they all lost huge percentiles of their pension funds. They were robbed, and it meant that he'd bought those companies, those those newspapers, vastly cheaper than it, it first appeared. Because when the prices were were organised, they had to take into consideration the contingent liability of the company's um, component of the of the pension funds that they never ended up having to pay. It was an incredibly nefarious thing that they did. Well, of course, we're seeing lately now the uh, with with the latest uh, the the Pope has has brought out the new modo propria, and uh, it would appear that all insurance has been pulled from all of these uh, company officials and uh, from lawyers and from barristers. So they now are not insured anymore to operate. So this is another interesting development uh, i don't know what's going on or or what the uh, the result will be but it seems that the vatican is coming on board and i believe that they're uh, they're supposed to be appe uh, the pope is supposed to be appearing in uh, in at the un isn't he supposed to be making a speech at the un correct yes so um, there's things afoot, there's things, and it's climate related as well. So it's, it's oh, you've ended I up on a positive the, note this week, Jimmy. I might point out. I think all these developments that we're seeing shows you that there is a sense of urgency coming into the discussion now, right. and that for yeah. me reflects how late in the day the whole process is. They've been they've been bullshitting about this now for ever and a day, and now the game is up for total denial. So what we all have to look out for now is the new denier, which is the ones where they're saying, "Oh yeah, look, you know, you." So People all relax. We're on to it. We're talking about it. Right. Talking about it's one thing. Doing anything about it is another. And we know that they're not going to do anything. Obama has just signed off with Shell for going and exploring in the Arctic. It's yeah. business as usual. Perhaps anything in, they per, do perhaps. now is just putting it's putting moisture on on moisturizer on it on a cancer that, that's going to kill us all. Perhaps there is nothing they can do about it. Well, we could take our foot off the accelerator. Yeah, we could. We could slow it down. We can't. We can't fix it. But mm. surely, to goodness, we could try and mitigate. You know, we're all anti-nuclear, the three of us. What I would really love to see is some kind of concerted campaign to to de to decommission all of the nuclear power stations on the planet. And, you know, that's so contrary to what James Hens is saying. He's saying go with nuclear. There. So, you know, there, there's there's a, the disparity of positions that, straight away. In, just yeah, one that's an interesting contrast there, Kevin, because of the fact that, like, he's brought out such a, a damning report and yet he's still pro-nuclear. And that is quite a contrast. Yeah, I have, yeah, an, well, I have an expression does. that I use a lot. Even a drowning man will grasp at straws. Yeah. I mean, they don't talk about NO2 that comes from all these nuclear processes. It's a worse greenhouse gas than CO2. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's um, and we're putting so much nitrate out in various other ways as well. So it's a huge problem, uh, the production of uh, nitric acid and, uh, um, and fertilizers. Well, of course, we're seeing so, those algae blooms, uh, a really serious one developing off the, uh, the, the west coast of America there. I, I, I believe, it, yeah. I believe yeah. it's stretching from California right up to Alaska. That's, that's not small. That's not small. No, and, and one of the things I've been quoting for a long time to 
where I've been saying that um, 40% of the oxygen on the planet is generated by phytoplankton. But a, a, a statistic I read the other day was that 70% of all oxygen on the planet is g generated by from the various fauna and flora in the oceans. Our oceans are dying before our very eyes and 70% of the oxygen comes out of them. Wow. Our forests are burning all around the planet and 30% of the oxygen comes out of them. How long does anyone think that this incineration go on and us be immune to it? It is not going to happen. No. Okay. Doom on. Doom on. Doom on. Doom on. Yeah, yeah. I think we've finished on a doomy note. Well done, Kev. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So we're, um, we're at risk of uh, all going off for a, a good night's sleep, but but we, I think we've ruined that quite nicely. Well done. So so yeah yeah no it's it's been a good good show actually. I think we had a, a little all round uh, about talk about stuff generally. It's been an extended uh, Doom report actually. It's uh, we're, uh -huh. we're we're hitting on yeah, fourteen sorry, minutes I've, here. I sort of feel like I'm taking over, but you know when you're talking about the end of human ex existence and the and the, the extinction of 150. To 200 species every day the reality is in the time that we've been speaking there's probably about 10 species on this planet gone extinct just think about that have a little empathy and compassion for those species who have equal importance and significance as we do yeah, and let's try and do something about it for you listeners yeah, out there try and you know? it. absolutely share the information yeah. absolutely having these discussions and sharing them around not just our ones but any ones at this level is really important we in the in the internet age and the blogosphere we have the opportunity to be citizen journalists it's our job to get the message out there if, if the mainstream media aren't going to do it we have to take responsibility well yeah, said Kev. Yeah, well said yeah yeah we'll go for that man so uh all right well i think we're going to wrap it up here we will yes. and uh thank you kevin for once again coming over we'll, we'll have a, a shorter and maybe a more slightly doomy report next week can we go for that I suspect that in the week that in an, in an exponential time of change, I think by this time next week we'll either have something extraordinary to talk about, or the internet won't be working. <laughs> okay, that'll be that 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 will probably say it quite nicely. I think <laughs> oh, the, there is there's so Thanks much time, coming out yeah. every week. It, you're you're being kept quite busy uh, generally, you know, just sticking with the climate stuff. So it's good to sort of get off topic a little bit and uh, kick back. Nice one, Kev. Wonderful. My pleasure. Thanks for all your time. Thank you very, very much, Kev. Cresce só dinheiro, você diz que